and after that, uh, each of us will, uh, uh, you know, talk about kind of uh, key issues in uh, uh, in the area between being famous and being scooped. Uh, and then uh, we'll just have uh, a discussion, and I'm sure that uh, uh, many of you have uh, uh, interesting or you know horrifying stories to relay and uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, you know good questions to ask. Um, so, um, Jonathan, you want to uh, start? Uh, yeah. Uh, sure, I'm Jonathan Eisen. I'm a professor in the Genome Center and in Evolution and Ecology and Medical Microbiology and Immunology. Um, and I've been involved in sort of open science initiatives for a long time. And I'm uh, mostly involved in one component of that, which is open access publishing. I'm the academic editor in chief of PLS Biology, and I'm involved in a sort of a variety of open access publishing. Um, open access sort of is not, there's, there's this big thing you could call open science and um, I think open science has some very important things related to getting famous or getting scooped. Um, open access publishing is not really a major component of that. That's more about what happens when you're done um, with uh, something and whether or not people can have access to that information and reuse it in a variety of ways. But I have also been heavily involved in the genomics world. So I worked at a genome center for eight years before moving to Davis. And the genome, genomics world in biology was one of the first places where people were forced to release their data prior to publication. Um, and uh, for many years, people tried to put disclaimers or caveats on the release of that data in order to try and prevent being scooped. Uh, by other people analyzing the data that you generated. So I can talk about that in a little bit in more detail because I have some uh, examples of both how people tried to prevent that from happening and uh, maybe why that wasn't a good idea. So uh, <laughs> my name is John Wilbanks. I am a senior fellow at the Newton and Marion Kaufman Foundation. Uh, and but I, probably the reason I'm here is that up until a couple of months ago, I, I spent seven and a half years at Creative Commons where I ran the science project. So I've been um, looking at uh, different pieces of the open science continuum that Jonathan mentioned. So uh, our licenses were broadly used and are broadly used in the open access publishing world. Uh, we also looked at uh, broader issues of open data, not just the legal side, but the technical, the social, and the reward framework around sharing data. Uh, why you would, why you wouldn't. Um, we looked at biological materials, why would get shared, why those wouldn't get shared. And uh, we looked very broadly at policies around open science as well. So we sort of ranged across a, a lot of different ground uh, in this this famous discrete continuum. Because um, I think it's a continuum and not a set of choices. And uh, we learned a lot of lessons. Most of them were depressing. <laughs> so I'm happy to talk about those. Uh, and what I'm working on now is actually something that is assuming that radical change is probably not going to come from very many scientists themselves. It's more likely to come from members of society who can capture data on their own, uh, making that available, as opposed to convincing people who are in the professional science guilds to change their behavior. Um, I'm uh, Mario Biagioli. Uh, I direct uh, the Center for Science and Innovation Studies that <coughs> is uh, hosting these events. And basically, we're really just uh, hosting it because the idea uh, of doing uh, this really came up, uh, uh, was put, put forward by the, the Davis uh, um, you know, Open Science uh, uh, Group. Uh, so you know, there were all sorts of interesting conversations going on on the, on the listserv, and so we decided to you know, have, you know, uh, meet uh, uh, in, in, a, in an embodied form to, to continue that uh, uh, the conversation. Um, I am uh, uh, very much interested in these issues, having worked on um, scientific authorship uh, first, and now I'm specifically working on a, on a, a little book on uh, plagiarism, and, and, and most of it uh, uh, in science. So. That's you know I'm I'm, I'm very eager to uh, he, you know collect uh, more uh, evidence uh, <laughs> if, uh, if if uh, if you have. 
Um, so at this point, so we have a brief, uh, brief presentation and discussions. So starting with Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, I can just, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about the genomics experiences I've had because they're sort of relevant to this whole open data and getting scooped issues. So um, I assume some people may know, but um, others may not, that uh, when the Human Genome Project was sort of booted up, um, there was a lot of discussion of access to the data being generated by the sequencing of the human genome, so reading the individual letters of the DNA sequence of the human genome. And this project sort of started slowly, so they didn't really um, make a big deal out of the, the data release, per se. And then sort of all of a sudden, when new technology came along, the ability to read DNA sequence data went kind of crazy and, and got fa much faster. And um, a guy named Craig Venter, who I used to work with, um, was at the NIH at the time and decided that he wanted to start using these new machines to do automated DNA sequencing to read portions of the human genome. And this started an ongoing controversy over what you would do with human genome sequence data. And Craig eventually left, he was at the NIH, he eventually left the NIH um, and started an institute called TIGER, the Institute for Genomic Research. That's where I worked for eight years. And he was there for a little while, and then he left again to start Solera, this company, to sequence the human genome. And when he did that, there was a very stressed response by the public consortium for sequencing the human genome, including the NIH and the Wellcome Trust, um, which were involved in funding this the public version of sequencing the human genome. And one of the things that they did it was to sort of portray Craig and Solera as the dark, evil empire of companies working on the human genome. And they came out with this announcement about data release policies. Um, they had already developed some, but they made an extra point about this. And it came from something, a meeting in Bermuda called the Bermuda Accord. And the general notion was that the sequence data would be released with no restrictions immediately upon its generation. In essence, connecting the DNA sequencing machines to a data display window, which didn't actually happen, but um, that was sort of the, the general concept. And um, they made a lot of stink about how they were doing this and benefiting the public good. And secretly, behind closed doors, they hated this. Um, they did not want to release the data with no restrictions because they didn't want to get scooped. And as part of this fear of getting scooped, they basically convinced the major DNA sequence database called GenBank, which was run by the National Library of Medicine, to release the human genome data into a special part of this database where they added a caveat in the data release agreement that said, you can access this data and use it to look at individual genes, but you do not have permission to do a genome-wide analysis based upon this data. In essence, preventing anybody from doing exactly what the Human Genome Project was about. Um, but they felt more comfortable when they added this caveat into what was, I think, I think this was before the Trace Archive existed, but it was something equivalent to what's called the DNA Trace Archive. And that caveat, you can look at genome data but not actually do a genome level analysis, was taken from our, my institute because we had been sequencing the genomes of other organisms, including Arabidopsis, uh, including many bacterial genomes, and we didn't want to get scooped either. So we had, we wanted to make it, you know, get a lot of credit for releasing data but not getting scooped, so we had written this one paragraph caveat that we posted on our FTP site and on our web server. We did not release the data into GenBank, but we released it onto our FTP site, and then they sort of took this same caveat to try and prevent people from scooping them in analysis of the data. And um, in essence, they, they did, uh, even though at the White House, they announced that the data was released with no restrictions for anybody to use to benefit humanity. That was actually a bald face lie. Um, and they pressured people relentlessly to not 
do genome level analyses of this data. If you published a paper using the data, they would call up the editors of the journals. They would, if they heard about a paper being submitted by peer reviewers telling them, even though they're not supposed to, um, they would call up the journals and pressure them to have the papers retracted and, and so on. And this, I can talk a lot about this whole history. It was very nasty um, and continues even to this day. I just heard uh, three weeks ago that there was someone who published a new paper analyzing some data from one of the genome centers. And um, the genome centers were pissed off about this, even, even though the, they've now removed this caveat. So there was a follow-up meeting to the Bermuda Accord after the human genome data was released in Fort Lauderdale. And some of the people who ran the public version of the Human Genome Project, including Francis Collins, um, got up and said, we should you know, continue this restricted release of the data. And they were voted down, basically. So there was a general agreement among the community that if you're getting millions and millions of dollars for the public good, to generate data that really is supposed to be analyzed as the entire unit of the data. You should release that data with no restrictions. And that has been the new data release policy for most of the big genome projects. And instead of a policy, they now basically have a mafia, which calls people up and says, you can't do that. Um, we will never collaborate you, with you. We will screw you in every way. Um, if you analyze the data that we are getting credit for releasing with no restrictions. Um, so I'd be happy to talk to people about the layers of complexity in this. And I'll just tell one quick story which came from that Fort Lauderdale meeting before ending off the torch here. So I was at the Fort Lauderdale meeting. I was the representative of TIGER, the Institute for Genomic Research, at that meeting. And um, I went in thinking that we should protect our data, and we shouldn't, you know, allow people to scoop us on analysis, you know, of this data that we were spending a lot of time generating. Um, and I came out not being convinced of that. I came out being convinced that we should release the data completely with no restrictions. And the reason I came out was basically two talks at that meeting. One was by David Lippman, the head of the National Library of Medicine's Biotechnology Database, NCBI. And he told the story of how Francis Collins made him put that caveat in the human genome sequence data despite lying about it at the press conference at the White House, um, which was disconcerting. And then this guy named Sean Eddy, who's a bioinformatics person at uh, the Howard Hughes campus, Janelle Farm, got up and basically said, you know, he's been releasing his software code for years, open source software, and occasionally someone takes something out of his code and might use it for a paper in some way or some idea that they've embedded in some comment in the code. But in general, he thought it was beneficial to release his code openly because he got a lot of help from people. And he said that, you know, the genome projects, you're getting hundreds of millions of dollars to generate data for the world. To argue that just because someone might scavenge through the data and find something and scoop you and therefore, in essence, delay science years until you publish your first paper on analyzing one of those genomes was unacceptable. And I went out of that meeting <laughs> deciding to do an experiment in open data release. So I went back to my institute where everybody was against open data release, and I released the data for my next project with no restrictions. The genome of this weird single-celled organism called tetrahymena, it's a, what's called a ciliate, we posted the data, sent an email out to this email list of people who were interested in this organism, and I'm very glad we shared the data openly because literally about two hours later, someone from British Columbia, a professor I know, emailed me to suggest that we might want to remove the anthrax data from our <laughs> tetrahymena <laughs> database. Um, so at genome centers, data gets mis mistracked, samples get mistracked, Things get contaminated. We hadn't found the contamination. He did in two hours. Um, he was an author on our paper, by the way, <laughs> after <laughs> helping us clean up the data. So I basically came out of that learning that rather than getting scooped, we got actually probably 40 collaborators from releasing the data openly. And we didn't get scooped on anything important. 
Um, so that's sort of my genomics uh, spiel. Uh, openness. Okay. Yeah. Why do you think that you didn't get scooped I mean, Was there not, were there not people? Well, we got there scooped. No, there were like 10 papers written on analysis of our genome before we published our paper. Um, but most of them were very focused. And our job was to generate the data and publish one of these big picture, you know, sort of, many of the genome papers are sort of review papers about everything you can find in a genome. So if someone finds one interesting story, that actually just gives us something else to refer to in the paper. It doesn't, it didn't hurt us in any way. Um, in addition, even then, and much more so now, people were overwhelmed with data. Um, and that was the beginning of the genomics era. Now, I mean, with uh, you know, personal citizen scientists taking pictures of every fungus in Point Reyes or every you know, uh, bird that they can find somewhere and posting it on Flickr. And, I mean, who's going to scoop who here? I mean, it's, who's going to look at everybody else's data? So even then, that was part of the issue. And that was 10 years ago. So. so I'm going to, to jump off from where Jonathan ended, which is I, I think the whole idea of being scooped is a very analog way of thinking about science. And it comes from a world in which information was scarce and rivalrous and not really plentiful. And when you're in a world in which information is scarce and rivalrous, when data is expensive, when a gene takes three years to sequence, right? There's a certain amount of rivalrousness <coughs> in economic terms to the data in that context. And the thing is that the technology that generates information has radically changed in the last 20 years, but the reward structures and the systems for tracking credit have radically changed in 20 years. So you still apply for R01s to the NIH uh, or to whatever funding agency you kneel before when you try to do science, um, and you still mainly track your impact through citations <coughs> in printed journals. And so those are systems that have not re really radically changed since the 1970s at the latest, right? maybe since the 40s or the 50s when sort of the post-war science funding structures came to be in the United States. Um, but, the, but the technologies that you use to practice science have changed. In, the, in that time period to, to where they're almost unrecognizable from the 40s, 50s, 60s. And that's the disconnect. That's why we have this fear of being scooped um, because the old reward systems assume that you have to, every three years, right, tie a bow on your research, compress it into a four-page paper, right, as if that can contain three years of work in a lab of seven authors. Um, and mail it off to a paper who then reprints it and mails it off to other people so it can be archived in libraries. Right? And then corrections happen through letters to the editor or papers that criticize your paper later. Right? So that's the reward system. And the fear of getting scooped comes out of a fear of not getting rewarded for work that you did. Uh, and that's because you don't have good credit mechanisms. But when you look at the unwillingness of scientists to actually share, right, even when dragged kicking and screaming as in the genomics uh, system, um, it's a rational economic response to the reality of being a scientist, which is that you'd like to have tenure, you'd like to have graduate students, you'd like to have a bigger lab, you'd like to have the chance to get a job at a better university, you'd like to be an editor for a major scientific journal. And rationally, hoarding is a, is a reasonable economic response to that. Uh, and the difference in, the, the thing that's starting to eat into that and to make it make sense to share is that people who collaborate more in a networked context get more collaborations and can get more papers on in a world where the information is an overflow. Because then the likelihood that someone in your network finds something interesting and gives you credit to go up as opposed to if you are rivalrous and you shut people out of your network, the odds that you choose the right collaborators go down. Right? If you're having to select every person who you work with individually in a world of data overflow, right, there's a very good chance you're going to miss the person who comes up with the really radical and unique interpretation of the information. Right? That's the definition of radical and unique interpretations. They're not the ones that you're thinking about. And so there's 
And Jonathan is one of the first of the, of the wave of people who are succeeding because they're open, not in spite of being open. But he's, not, uh, he's far from the only person who's doing it. Um, and we can sort of, I, I'm happy to give you more depressing examples of, of sharing failing. Uh, <laughs> uh, like, uh, but it's okay, so, uh, I spent years, and Alan, Alan does what the materials transfer world is like. Right? It's, a, it's a nightmare. Uh, if you think data is hard to get people to share, think about the actual tools that you've constructed, right? Uh, antibodies, cell lines, uh, reagents, probes, things that you've constructed in your lab if you're a biologist. Um, those are not um, digital goods, right? If you want to make them for someone else, you've got to actually devote lab time to do it. Uh, they're not uh, costless, right? So you've got to actually um, spend money of your own to make materials and send them to someone else. And they are far more empowering than data because they let you run a new experiment in your same world or verify your experiment very, very quickly. Uh, and so they're incredibly competitive. They're, they, they create a 10 to 1 barrier to research compared to patents in, in research in economic study after economic study after economic study. So we spent seven years trying to convince scientists that it was in their best interest to uh, make those materials available <coughs> promiscuously because then they would get more citations for those materials, they'd get more co-authorships uh, and so forth. And basically we got zero uptake, right, anywhere. Um, the only good news, and this is, this is recapitulating one of the iron rules of science, which is that if you do something right, the reward is that someone else copies it and doesn't give you credit. So the NIH announced an electronic materials resource initiative this week with no references to our work or to the Hoffman <laughs> Foundation's years of work on iBridge or Alan's work on Pimpra. Right? You would think that the idea came straight from their head, like you know, Athena being ordered from Zeus. Did they at least make up a good acronym? Uh, EMRA, with a little E and a big M. Um, so, good on you guys. Uh, and we'll see how well it works. But the reality is, uh, I, I was pitching this to a scientist at MIT who had a, 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 a vast resource of materials uh, from a model organism that were being spun down because the grant was disappearing. And the idea was, why don't you make these materials widely available to the entire model organism community that you're working on? Uh, because you're, you know, you've got a three-year backlog and you've got one year of funding. And you're going to have to destroy these samples because you're not going to process them in time and they're going to deteriorate. Um, and you can put them out under a contract that says you can have the materials, and the, and, but you have to make the data available back on my website, give me credit. They had a you know, community lineup that would process them, and the PI said to me, I owe the community nothing, and I would rather destroy the samples <laughs> than make them available so someone else could get any papers written whatsoever. This was said directly to me across the table, and I very much like that. And I remember sitting going, this isn't about getting famous or getting skipped, it's about keeping my foot on the neck of my competitors. And so you can say, oh, I don't want to get scooped. But if you're a powerful scientist, what you're doing is keeping your foot on the neck of everybody who might have a better idea. Um, and that is a really powerful drive in science because there are so few jobs and so little money. And the average age of, of the, the average age of the person who gets their first R01 grant from the NIH is now, I think, 39 years old. And that's up from early 30s over a 25-year period. So it's getting harder and harder to get your first grant, to get your first lab. So the more people you keep out, the more money there is for you. And so I, I think it's an economic thing. And that's, that's why I think, A, people who are open are going to collaborate better and are going to win because it's just a better filtering mechanism um, than choosing everything yourself, just like Google works better than the old Yahoo algorithm. Uh, but second is that um, the scientific system is eventually going to crack under pressure. It's just not going to be sustainable. With what got. So... Uh, it's a depressing reality. I think the easiest way is to find people who don't worry about this crap and work with them rather than trying to convince people who need to be convinced. Because it's very hard to convince someone of an economic reality when their job depends on not noticing that economic reality. I'll stop that. You wait for the old guard to die. Science, well, so science does progress one death at a time. It's not my quote. It's one funeral. <laughs> That's the actual quote. Thanks for coming. Uh, so I think your story, Jonathan, about Tetrahymena was sort of telling that it's the, uh, it's the interplay between uh, data release and peer review. And so, you know, you can release a lot of data without peer review. And, you know, it's questionable. So in your case, you released it, it got out there, it had, you know, the peer review came, 
uh, when it was out there and your colleague yeah. came back and said, you know, you can't answer it. So anyway, I just, there is always this <coughs> tension, and it's, you know, it's back to your point too, John, that the old world and the new world, the old world, very dependent on peer review, um, you know, which we still rely on as a quality, quality filter. So anyway, there's just a... Well, I, I want to follow on that. I mean, the old world, I mean, the old system was the best we could have, right? I mean, it was actually really well fitted to the environment that it ran, which is where you had to, you know, the only knowledge compressing algorithm you had was to write it down and mail it. Uh, but we have other systems available. We haven't evolved any of the ways to give credit back. And so that's why there's, you know, if you could get famous by being open, because you could get lots of dimensions of credit back, including peer review and all these things, and I think people wouldn't worry about being scooped. They would, they would begin to maximize their sharing because would, that would maximize their credit. But we have, you know, we've been very good at building technologies to create and distribute data. We've been very, very bad at systems that actually track the influence of those and provide it back to someone who shares. So, so directly related to that too is at the Fort Lauderdale meeting, I proposed um, an idea which we had already been working on, which was data publication. Um, and that is, you could have a mini peer review of the data, you, the genome centers, you know, you could do this with any data, and lots of people have talked about this for many years. You could write a paper just describing the data. Mm -hmm. That could go through some sort of peer review, and that would then give people something, a DOI, mm -hmm. something to cite, mm -hmm. that they would, if they use the data, the, one of the big problems was this credit system. If you release the data to a website, how do people cite that? Some journals didn't allow references to websites. Uh, that that was one of the big issues. So I said, why don't we just publish, you know, data marker? They call them marker papers, and that is what many of the genome centers have started to do. We're um, at the Joint Genome Institute. Um, every genome that gets sequenced um, gets submitted as a sort of data marker paper to this new open access sort of genome data journal um, in order to basically work with the old system <laughs> um, to give this sort of citable unit and have you know a modicum of traditional peer review for the data. Um, th this is very interesting because actually it dovetails uh, in nicely in, in, in what I'm thinking about being scooped uh, in terms of publications. So my, my, what I've looked at is not so much data. Actually, the first time that I seriously thought about data was uh, when you guys invited me to that uh, event that you had last year about the NSF uh, you know, guidelines for data. So, um, so, so what I've looked at is mostly uh, plagiarism of publications. And, and so in that case, what comes up is that actually I don't see the big tension between open and, and pleasure and, and you know being being open and being scooped because effectively with publications the best uh, the, the best safeguard against the uh, plagiarism is actually publishing uh, and, you know for, you know even uh, you know even uh, you know even by publication I mean circulation if you're, if you're a graduate student you have a, an interesting paper that you haven't published you know at least in my experience what I used to do as a graduate student I would make 20 copies 30 copies and send it out to a lot of people so you have witnesses so you have, you have planted copies of your text uh, in, in a lot of places so publication I think does work uh, is a pretty good antidote uh, against scooping also because if you're scooped if you're if somebody plagiarizes your publication actually I don't think and I know some people would disagree with this I don't think that the damage is substantial because the data that is available right now is that plagiarized scientific publication get republished in uh, like uh, third uh, rank uh, journals to avoid detection. So basically, plagiarism is not really plagiar. You know, it's a different circulation of publications. You know, so and because credit goes with priority. The original, the author of the original publication gets really most of the credit, and I don't think that the secondary publication takes a lot of credit away. So, publication, I think, uh, it is the best attitude to scooping, even when scooping happens. I don't think it's uh, it's uh... so. Um, 
uh, and also think I think the experience with uh, Arkiv in, in the among the physicists I think Arkiv actually keeps plagiarism in check because you know you can <coughs> something out most of the time without peer review that creates a a, a time stamp uh, that is, is is difficult to uh, mess around with so. What I find interesting about these comments about data is that what I've noticed is that the plagiarism that I think is most hurtful is plagiarism of grant applications and uh, manuscripts. So what I think that has to do with what you guys are talking about is that uh, what, I, what I like to say is that that kind of scooping effectively scoops time. Because once you have a publication that is done and you put it out, it's done, it's a product. What you do is that by scooping a grant proposal is that you scoop, you take the time, you, know, you basically jumpstart your own work by lifting a grant proposal. So you get basically one year on the person who had filed the grant proposal. So basically what you do is that you steal time, okay? not uh, text. So the analogy here is that the thing about data, although data, so data, what is being scooped by scooping data, effectively is, is what is being scooped is the potential of the work that one could do with the data, right? So it's not the data itself, but it's the potential for the work. So effectively, it's a, you know, I would say that it's like stealing time. So, so that's, that's why uh, the, the analogy between um, unpublished texts, such as grant proposals and uh, art, you know, and manuscripts, and and data. Although they are, they seem to be kind of apple and oranges. But the damages produced by scooping either those kind of texts or data are similar because you are scooping up uh, um, uh, effectively time. Now, the problem here is that the law doesn't help at all <laughs> because, because, I mean, you know, a number of comments that have come up here are about, well, effectively we need to turn data into a work so that we can get credit for it. So either write a little uh, something on the data or have data peer reviewed. So effectively we're, we're trying to turn data into some kind of text, you know, or, or a work. Right now, IP doesn't recognize data as anything that can be protected. So data, you know, you cannot, uh, I mean, the, the famous uh, phone book uh, case, uh, data is not, you, you can neither patent it nor copyright it. Uh, in Europe, you have some moderate, there is a special ad hoc legislation on uh, database protection. But it's mostly about how the data is organized and can be retrieved rather than the content of the data. So data, legally speaking, is not protectable. So the challenge here is how to <coughs> develop conventions, practices to turn both data into a work rather than simply, oh, that's just data. So a work uh, and then uh, be able to protect it because the law doesn't help it. Now, this is the Federal Register uh, definition of scientific uh, 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 misconduct. This is the bid on plagiarism. So, uh, May 2005. Uh, the appropriation of another person's ideas, processes, results, or words without giving appropriate credit. So, you see that words is just one example of scientific plagiarism. So you have processes, which could probably would also include techniques or the kind of stuff that uh, would be the, the, the object of, uh, of MTAs. Results, which, you know, clearly it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's data, and also ideas, which, which again, IP does not uh, protect all the time. IP protects ideas if you have patented, but if uh, Alan and I have a chat over coffee and Alan tells me this great idea he has that he's working on, if he hasn't patented, I can, you know, I can snatch it, you know, publish, do whatever he wants, and you will be able to go come after me because I violated, uh, you know, the, the you know, it could be a case of scientific misconduct, but you can't sue me, you know, for IP violation, right? So, but, but let me just challenge yeah. your one statement that, yeah. uh, that 
that no one can own data. Um, so we, I was just involved in releasing the COVID genome. So it was a uh, new genome and uh, all the issues of being scooped and competition there. Um, so, but we actually, in consultation with uh, lawyers, determined that uh, we did, in fact, own the data. And so we treated the data the same way we treated material with the material transfer agreement, um, except we called it a information access agreement. Um, and so the portal to the website, you have to go through this information access agreement, which becomes a contract. So you okay, are a contract, using yeah. a contract to protect your mm -hmm. uh, property, yeah. if you yeah. will. And you know, that particular agreement said, you know, you can use it, you can do genome-wide analysis, you can do whatever you want, but you can't patent the other one. So this is about the Can you redistribute? Uh, only under the same terms of the IAA. Um, so the, yeah, so the IAA will follow uh, whatever you do. Um, so this was all about patenting gene sequences, and all your genomes, the human genome and everything else, 30% of it's patented, and the sequences came from the public. Uh, database, which sort of gets to what does public release mean? The, the hard part about the IIA is, is that if, if this is where IP is different than real property, right? So you can treat data as real property. It's exactly. a contract. Yeah. Oh, so he's talking That's about contract. Yeah. You can make a contract about But the difficulty is that, of course, that if, if one person breaks the privity chain of the contract and posts it, right? If I, if I send it to Jonathan, Jonathan sends it to Mario. Mario's in India, Mario uploads the genome without the contract, and then you know, Nestle comes along and downloads it from Mario's copy, he's not bound by the contract. Whereas if that had been a Britney Spears song, the copyright would have followed it without any magic. Yeah, that's copyright's magic, yeah. right, that way. It's, it's evil and magical, and that's what lets it be open as well as closed. So it's, it's, it's hard. What did the journal say about this? Uh, well, so the data did not go to GenBank? Yeah. Yeah, it all went to uh, GenBank as well, but accessible. GenBank supported this, precisely uh, that contract in HapMap. That was basically exactly how HapMap worked. It is, yeah. Yeah, very simple. Yeah. Um, so there, actually there was, uh, uh, there were owners of the data who uh, either did not agree with this at all, just because it is a restriction. Um, so, you know, just as you were talking about, different kind of restriction, but it's not a, a totally free release. It is restricted. So, but any, it, I think, raises a question, what, is a, what does a public release mean if you can go in and actually appropriate the sequences through the patents? You know, like, uh, so it's not staying, you know, it's not remaining in the public unless you have some safeguards against it. So I, I don't really know what a public release is, actually. But I think a completely unrestricted release is not public here. It allows people to appropriate it. Anyway, I think I have a Yeah, yeah, no, but no, 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 no. This, uh, I take your point, but, but my point was that, that intellectual property does, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in certain cases where there's a, a, you, you can turn, say, uh, genetic information into data, you know, I, I, that, that you can make to fit uh, the boxes of, of patent law, then, you know, it's covered. But mm -hmm. even in your case, I mean, again, you're talking about contracts, you're not talking intellectual property. So actually, right. I'm not even sure that you can say that the contract means that you own the data. You're just saying, no, oh, if you <coughs> want access to this, you have to sign this. It doesn't mean that you are <coughs> the owner. It just means that, you know, if you want access, you have to sign this contract. So I, I, I'm not sure that they, uh, legally speaking, that that contract construes you as an owner. You, you're just uh, the, you're just restricting access unless people. So, so the challenge is that here, uh, you know, I, I, the tools to, you know, either protect ideas or protect uh, data are, you know, in the making. You know, because I don't think IP uh, provides uh, law. Uh, in terms of uh, Evidence. The the thing about the the, the scooping of uh, um, grant proposal is uh, is quite pervasive, and uh, the the majority of plagiarism cases that have been uh, looked at by the Office of Research Integrity uh, have involved uh, 
uh, plagiarism of grant proposal. And usually what the way it works is that so the proposal is sent to somebody, that person plagiarizes it, uh, and then if he or she has sufficient resources, you know, just runs with it, or sometimes they uh, write a nasty report so that they kill the application, and then they resubmit it in a revised form, and then they put the person whom they have plagiarized <coughs> on the no review list. And you know, these cases most of the time are found because uh, the, the NSF or the NIH decide that it's peculiar that this person has been ruled out, so they send it to the person, <laughs> and the person say, yes, uh, this is a great proposal, it happens to be mine. <laughs> so, so the issue is, um, th this is bringing up some serious issue about peer review. So here, uh, uh, and this is what you know interests me a lot, is the fact that a lot of scooping is is not done by you know just somebody reading your work and uh, liking it so much that they reprint it with their name on it, but a lot of the, the, the particularly pernicious scooping is the byproduct of uh, uh, of uh, peer review. So the the, 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 the so to go back to the uh, to, you know Jonathan was suggesting that you know maybe you know one could have you know uh, you know peer review of data. It's, it's not clear <laughs> that the peer review of data would be, I mean, I understand what you're saying, and I think it's a good idea, but it looks like, you know, scooping is bringing up some, some you know, a good problem with, uh, with peer review, which suggests that perhaps peer review, you know, should also become open in the sense that, you know, people, the names of the peer reviewers should be not only released at the end of the year, you know, as, as, a, as a group, but, you know, you should both get credit for, uh, reviewing, uh, I, I, I'm a proponent of the idea that uh, uh, if you do a lot of work in making a manuscript better, I'm not saying that you should become a co-author, but that you should be acknowledged. And at the same time, you know, responsibility that the names of, uh, of the peer reviewers uh, should, uh, I think, should become uh, uh, public. That's. Can I jump in real quick? Oh, so sure. no, I'm just back. take the ball. Has anyone here read the Eighth Day of Creation? Okay, so I've been, I've been sort of scanning the shelves for it. Uh, that and Laboratory Life by Bruno Latour are These yeah, are the old books. This is the overflow. Don't look at So the <laughs> Eighth Day Creation, it's by a guy named uh, Horst Jensen. And it's the story of sort of the, the years that built up to the years that Jonathan was talking about. And there's a beautiful section on the, on the discovery of the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick. And it's one of the canonical examples of getting scoops is what happened to Roz Frank. Because she took the, the photograph. And it's an interesting dichotomy between the IP, because that photograph was a creative work, but it also represented data. And it was shown to Watson and Crick at a critical moment. <clears throat> and so she had, she had the photograph, it, it like clearly showed that it was a double helix, but she didn't understand it, right? And she was actually non-collaborative as an individual. She didn't really like working with other people. She was very gifted in the lab, but she didn't work well as a collaborator. And now, so she had the data, it meant nothing to her in the context of what it meant. Um, and all it took was one view of the picture for Watson and Crick to know that they were right. So they didn't need a copy. So it didn't trigger copyright law. Right? And that's what plagiarism and, and scooping is a sin and not a crime. And it's very different. It's important to understand the difference between sin and, and things that can be prosecuted in a court of law. Right? And so, you know, here's an example where her fear of being scooped, if she, had, if, she had, if she had not been scooped, it's arguable that we wouldn't have gotten the structure of DNA for years. Right? And is that right, socially better or not? Now, the argument of whether or not she was scooped would also be different if she hadn't died before the Nobel Prize was issued. Because she would have clearly been issued the Nobel Prize if she'd been alive at the time that they gave it to Watson and Crick. But they don't give the Nobel Prize to people who are already dead. Right? So we might be having a very different argument if she doesn't die of cancer at the year she dies of cancer, but instead four or five years later and gets a share of the Nobel Prize. Because it's hard to argue she would have been scooped if she'd been a Nobel laureate. Right? So I would, I would encourage you to read that section of the book because it shows how complicated the discovery of the structure was, how collaborative it was. It came out of the phage and the virus groups 
hanging out and playing <coughs> tennis and drinking beer at Cold Spring Harbor. <laughs> right? It came out of very you know, social interactions among the scientists involved. Um, and it led to this moment where all it would take is a 10 second viewing of one photograph and have it all click. So part of what we do science for is to lead to that moment where the right data at the right time leads to an oh shit epiphany. And years of, years of things suddenly seem simple and, and make it into a story. And so we want to lead to more of those moments as a society that invests in science. Even though it might not be in the best interest of the individual scientists involved economically. So the question is how you create the incentives for that without facilitating exploitation through peer review, without facilitating lockup by large powerful scientists who prevent the publication of papers. And it's not easy to do. I mean, social engineering tends to work worse than the existing systems that it attempts to engineer. So building systems that actually work inside them is not trivial. And so you know, looking at those books of, of how sharing happened and how scooping happened and the importance of scooping in the acceleration of science over and over and over again is actually really relevant to this conversation. And I, I would encourage you guys to read that piece of that book. So John, one thing I want to pin you down on, you have pointed out that when you sit down with these scientists, you have argued that it is in their benefit as individuals, as well as the fact that it is in their benefit, you know, for the greater good, blah, blah, um, to share that. And, and they have come back at you and argued, no, it is not. And I'm, I'm just curious, in your assessment, given the state of the way things are today and the credit economy that the scientists operate in, is it your belief that those scientists that stick their neck on their collaborators are indeed behaving optimally for that setting? Or are they being you know, I think risk, it's more risk adverse than it's they're optimal. behaving optimally? I think it's plausible. I mean, I, I, I have seen enough people succeed by sharing that I think that it is not a zero-sum game. Uh, but I can, I can understand it. I wouldn't do the same thing, but I can understand it, right? It's, you know, this is working for the, most of those scientists. They're at top institutions. You know, if you're at MIT or Harvard or you know Stanford or Cal Berkeley, and you have tenure and you have lots of years, why change? So I'm curious. There's an ecologist in me that has this perspective. Of, you look at resources and you think there's this theory: if you have lots of resources, you you, you can be risk adverse. If you have very little, you, you you need to take risks because there's only by those large events do you have any hope of getting up up to the top. Right. And so, if it would, in how would you react to extrapolating that to the story that the people that are most like that, they're behaving optimally if they are indeed you know top of their field, senior researcher with the big grants, and they would not be behaving optimally by doing that if they are new researcher that does not have the grants. Or or is the optimal strategy the same no matter if you are unfunded or super funded? So it's a great question, and I'm going to answer with opinions, because I don't have data. Right? Uh, there seems to be a curve, which is that your resistance to sharing probably peaks when you really get to the top, before you get to the top of the field. Once you're at the top of the field, you can be varmus, you can be, you know, you can be very radically open once you're at the top of your field, because you're already at the top of your field, and then you just entrench yourself by being more open. Um, there is some research, I need to dig up, um, I heard it at the data citation meetings in, in Berkeley in August, that younger scientists are less likely to share than older scientists because they're more worried about getting to the tenure slot than the people who already have tenure. And so it's sort of after tenure is when people start to share. Right? There's a sliding scale towards openness after that. And there is actually sociological and ethnographic data that demonstrates this. And I don't have it at my fingertips, but I'll, I'll try to find it. I'll send it to Jonathan and we'll tweet it and all that. Uh, <laughs> but this whole digital native myth of, you know, young scientists will come along and blow away the old system. The data actually demonstrate the exact opposite, which is that, uh, you know, when you've got, if you've got six years to get two science, nature, cell, PNAS publications, you are a lot less likely to share anything. Um, you know, one of those is the fear of getting scooped. One is the, co the, the economic cost and time cost of preparing information for other people to consume, which is non-trivial also. And that's sort of the flip side, which is that not only are you afraid of getting scooped, you've got to take a lot of time that could otherwise be spent doing research in order to share stuff. And so, and that's, that's an unspoken piece of this as well, uh, which is, you know, if I've got to spend six weeks preparing a data set for you to look at, and I'm going to get scooped on it, then economically and rationally, it's, it's not an optimal choice. So 
Constitution Council tenure? I would I would be happy to get all of you tenure. <laughs> I would love to have tenure somewhere myself, but I don't have a PhD. <laughs> well, I have a follow-up question. So, these big name, top of their field scientists, don't they have some responsibility to their graduate students and their postdocs? And where does that responsibility end? Because it's obviously going to take a graduate student a uh, considerably longer amount of time to achieve some result with the data than uh, <coughs> other well-established scientists or postdocs. And then, to, where do you draw the line there? It's a good question. I don't know. I mean, the, the data, the, there's some studies out of Duke on materials sharing. Um, Walsh, Cohen, and Cho are the three authors. Uh, that have said that basically one of the number one reasons why PIs don't send out materials is to protect their graduate students' capacity to publish and get jobs. So that's one of that's a very important pressure that keeps PIs closed. Um, I prefer not to put this in the hands of the PIs. I prefer to put this in the hands of the funding agencies. And so it, I can't blame a PI for doing that to protect a graduate student. But the question is, if that's taxpayer money going into science, then I think the taxpayer has the responsibility or the obligation to receive benefit back from the investment. Um, you don't have to go into science. You don't have to choose to get federal money. You don't have to choose to take money from the wealth trust. Uh, but if you do, then you're going to be subject to certain conditions. And I think that that's, that's the sort of thing that societies have to decide and that funders have to decide, not that we should put the responsibility on individual fiat. Because it's, it makes absolute sense emotionally, economically, to protect your home turf. And I think the more that we put that pressure on individual scientists, the more likely they are to, to be protected until we completely change the culture. Is the reluctance to share that you've seen the same regardless of the availability of protections like Creative Commons licenses or these contract mechanisms and so forth, do those make any difference at all in this regard? Well, it depends on the discipline. I mean, in astronomy and in physics, the vast majority of the data are shared fairly quickly compared to biology. Mm -hmm. There's no money. Uh, there's no external money, I should say. There's grant money, but there's not you know, an IPO market for astronomy. Uh, there's no venture capitalists throwing money into hot astronomy companies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, but that's really important, right? Uh, and we'll take a, it if they're yeah. interested. <laughs> there's, a small number, there's a small number of telescopes. There's a small number that you don't have telescopes in every lab. So you've got to create norms that facilitate the sharing of information. Um, do you think that's more important than the recognition, uh, the cultural recognitions within science? Because you might argue they're the same, but you might argue they're different. They value archive as you know publication, and the biologist sees the archive as not yet published. I, I think you see that in physics and math. You know, there are people who never publish their papers in our peer-reviewed journals, they just put them in the archive. But do you think the cultural differences within science are more important, or it's the external pressure, such as venture capital, that's the real difference between biology and physics? I think it's some of both. I mean, it depends on who you read. Uh, Paul David's done some really interesting work on why different scientific disciplines share versus others. Right? Very sort of, you know, hundred-year analysis of math and physics versus biology. Uh, but I think that in, in biology in particular, the big money has a, an unusually large effect. Just a comment on that big money. Yes, and, talk uh, to them. Yeah, I guess the, the, the other thing is uh, uh, for graduate students and the postdoc fellows, uh, maybe big money is uh, too big in front, uh, but uh, the necessity to get a job is already oh, yeah. very important, uh, which requires a lot of competition yeah. in the current market. So, I mean, one thing that has come up in the discussion, in discussions a lot, is a lot of our behavior in these areas is based upon what we perceive the correct behavior should be. And so, for example, people think that you need a nature paper or a cell paper or a science paper in biological research in order to cross over <coughs> some threshold. And it's hard to test this. So the fact is, those are big name journals. The fact is that people doing interesting work submit their papers to those journals. It's hard to establish whether or not if you did interesting work and it was 
published in Joe's Journal of Medical Nothings, um, but was suddenly deemed to be very interesting, if that would cost you anything. And the same is true for an enormous number of other practices related to sharing, etc. So I, I think that there's a, and this may go into the hundred year history of some of these fields, I mean I think that some of it is real differences, that is in biology there is, for example, projects where you sign an agreement that says you can't publish something. Right, so that makes it challenging for grad students and postdocs to establish their career. Um, again, in astronomy, that's unlikely to happen. Um, you cannot publish a description of planet XY 1174. Our um, national security. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so there are some real differences, but if you talk to people about what the, a lot of it is just perceived differences without uh, data to back up what that is. So you can, um, by changing, for example, the grant funding mechanism, very rapidly cause change, right? If, if, if you say, you have to do this or you don't get an R1 grant, people will generally do that regardless of what their perceived right, uh, behavior is, in part because they had no data to back up what they were doing anyway related to either sharing or they were just doing what they thought was the right thing to do. And if all of a sudden a simple rule comes out that says if you want an R1 grant, for example, NIH now says when you submit an, a grant application, you have to list the PubMed central IDs for your papers that have been deposited into PubMed Central with previous NIH funds. So NIH now has a requirement that after a certain amount of time, your publications supported by NIH funds have to be deposited into the state. And not everybody does this, but they then ask for the ID for those publications when you submit your renewal. And it's, it has cost some people the ability to get grants by set, or at least the first round of review, by the being told, you know, you have to get, you, you're not going to get funding because you haven't put any of your private previous research into PubMed Central. So you could do a lot from the top down, in essence. I agree that the social engineering part is very messy, very complicated. I view it as like this 700 point front, you know, to, right. there's so many things that have to change in order to get something to happen unless you have a stick or a carrot that is gonna, gonna drive it. If you're just trying to convince people that a different practice is the correct optimal foraging theory or whatever it is, that's much harder. And I can tell you, it doesn't work. Yeah. I'm just trying to convince people that it's the right thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> but is that because they're right? And you're wrong? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> well, I, 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 I have to entertain it as a possibility. Well, I, I, I go back to Jonathan, and you, you both have this way of putting this out, like you pointed out. It, it is indeed possible that people are wrong in the sense that they could publish in that in Joe Schmo's journal instead of in Nature, and they would be just as successful. An economist might if it, do a thought experiment, might argue that that can't be true if it's sufficient enough, some stupid person would publish in these other journals their good stuff, you know, just because there's enough scientists, someone would try it out. And because there's less cost to publishing in those journals, maybe the review process is faster or something, eventually we would discover that that was the better mechanism in the current system, and they would take over. So, and, so can I just to answer that part? Yeah. I disagree with something John said before and something that's implied here. I absolutely fundamentally do not believe that systems are even remotely optimal. I think that the system we have is the system we have. And people argue that it is adaptive simply because they're in that system and they like to think that somehow it's hit some local optimum. I'm not even convinced it's hit a local optimum, let alone the global <laughs> optimum towards what would operate as an ideal system. So I think that... Well, I, th I think that's a very interesting point, because it's one statement is it's locally optimized, and therefore the only thing you can do is change the funding. And the other statement is it's not locally optimized. Scientists are doing something relatively stupid, and so if you as a new scientist try something different, you'll find, even without changing everything about the way science operates, you'll find, you can find a better optimum. Right, so this goes back to your issue of risk. Right. So, so I'm tenured, I'm well established in my field, 
I can do whatever the fuck I want. I mean, it, I'm sorry. I mean, it just doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? I, I mean, I'm not Harold Varmus or anything, but I can take these risks. So I, when I did this tetrahyman thing, I wasn't that established, but I was already getting there. I wanted to do experiments. I did not believe the system was optimized. And I said, let's do the experiment. Let's try a new thing. And this is how I view everything that I do. Everything. I want to try experiments with Twitter. Experiments, you know, I get New York Times articles written about my work because of Twitter, mind you, right? So I know Carl Zimmer through, through Twitter, and it's certainly not hurting me, but I couldn't tell you the number of scientists who are like, why are you bothering with social media? And so, but it, I view it as an experiment. Now, having two of my graduate students here, um, I try not to experiment with them. <laughs> so I also go to the old school system as much as I can in order to try and mediate the risk that they're taking because they're not a set. So there's a weird balance there with things that I'm doing as an individual I can take more risks. I can try and get money to support their work view, via the risks I take. But I have to try and mediate some of that risk to try and guarantee that they establish themselves in the system. Well, I, mean, I, I think it's a fair point. That I, I really think that there is the, the funding is the biggest stick between the data sharing. And there's you know 101 companies that have started you know, within two hours of here that are trying to provide different tools for data sharing and publication and, and credit and what have you. So there's a lot of different battles that the front is being fought on, but science, the, the funding and the publishing of science moves very slow. And so I continue. I actually do sort of think that the old system was relatively well fitted to paper publish because that creates an inherent rate on how much you can physically print and mail around because it was expensive to mail stuff. Uh, but all of those constraints have dropped away, but all the controls run. And so it's hard, and I think Jonathan articulated it very well, which is that you, I think you can be fairly successful by taking a different approach if you're already successful in your field, but you still have to balance it against the interest of the people who haven't attained that level yet, who you're responsible for. And that sort of um, mentor relationship and the, and the sort of miniature guild master apprentice relationships that permeate science socially actually create really strange influences on the system. Uh, and that's why I think it can make it, it might not make sense for a PI to be controlling information for his or herself, but for the people that are both, both, you know, below them, like it might make an enormous amount of sense for the collective to prevent information sharing. Now, even though labs that won't let people go drinking at conferences when they're close to a big publication. Right, I mean, it's it, as above, so below in, in many cases. And, and the whole system is going to have to change, and it's going to change in a non evenly distributed form. Right? Some, some people will do it better than others, some people will do it faster than others, some funders will catch on faster than others, some disciplines will go faster than others. But I think it is sort of the reality that information leaks because it's very hard to untitle it. And if it could be, you know, costlessly reproduced and distributed, then all it takes is one tiny leak, one USB drive. Right? One Twitter one, post. One Twitter post, one cloud account with, with whose password has let me in. Okay. <laughs> You've seen the top 10 list of passwords? They're great. Like the most commonly available passwords. It, yeah, they're like let, one, two, three, four, five, six, birthday, let me in, I love you. <laughs> password. password. <laughs> so given that you can't really protect and sue someone who reposts it, people who can live in that world and thrive in that world versus people who get screwed by that world, I think will be more fitted, whether it's optimal or not. So what, what, one, a couple of comments. You, you know, I, I like, you know, the, the way, I, I mean, I like your analysis about, look, you know, there, there was a, the old traditional system that kind of worked, or at least we don't have you know, data to prove it didn't. Exactly. Uh, and now we're in a situation where, you know, there's a lot of more information, so the issue is not so much about being screwed, but it would be nice if we could actually maximize what we can do. And, and, but then, you know, what kind of metrics of credit uh, do we develop uh, to, to make sure that people have careers and so on? But actually, what's, you know, but the few proposals that have been floated around or mentioned, 
effectively they are about you know you know evaluating turning this thing into products so you know uh, data you know they get a peer review so it kind of counts like a publication so it can be put in a box uh, you know, it can be all put on a CV, maybe, you know, it can be cited, and so it can be processed through the normal credit system. So effectively, it, what it seems like is that there is an attempt to adapt uh, the logic, actually use the logic of the old uh, uh, system. That is, whatever you do, let's try to figure out how they can be turned into a product for which you can get uh, credit. So it's not so much about rethinking the credit system of science, but it's more about uh, expanding the currency, you know, <coughs> adding more currencies to the, so, so it doesn't look like there is, so actually this is a question, do you think there is, you know, is there any, any uh, completely alternative model about uh, doing this uh, without the individual credit model, the author, you know, the author of text, the author of data, the author of techniques? So can, can we do away, I, mean, I know it's, this is the multi-billion dollar question, but I, I'm, I'm curious, do you see any glimmer of that, or we're talking about expanding the logic of the old uh, model to cover new objects? Can I talk about David Barker papers a little more? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so, so there is one component where people are trying to um, adapt that existing system uh, so, tracking IDs for all of your contributions to the scientific field. So, for example, I'll just give you one example of this. How do you know um, if John Smith wrote paper number one versus paper number 11? There are a lot of John Smiths. Um, we don't actually have a universal author ID that is used robustly. But there are many people that have proposed systems for doing this, and there are experiments with this out there. Establishing that would invigorate the ability to track individual contributions in some sense. It's not changing the system, mm -hmm. but it is taking advantage of, in essence, the web mm -hmm. and the ability to insert a tag into files to or posts or whatever to track the contributions of an individual in a variety of ways. So it, it is not an evolution at all of the system. It is the currency that you're talking about. The data publications is also like that. So um, getting a paper, whatever you want to call it, um, with a document identified, DOI ID, um, with your name on the publication is uh, the currency. And what we're, people are proposing is to make new things have that currency. So data publications, um, software updates, uh, blog posts, um, whatever it is, would get a, you know, a modicum of that existing currency. And I think those are important, useful tools in changing the system because what we do now is we evaluate people poorly. We don't even have good information about their actual contributions, let alone are we able to judge whether or not they're being open or collaborative or, and so some of these things are about just more accurately monitoring, measuring, tracking people's contributions. I think that there is, there has been discussion, um, many discussions about trying to change the currency itself. Um, it doesn't work frequently, so I'll give you one example in genomics. When I was at this institute, we were sequencing the first plant gene out of this model organism called Arabidopsis. And, um, all the people involved uh, thought that they were going to make a lot of money off of somehow being senior author on the first paper on the Arabidopsis genome. And they fought like you wouldn't believe. The, the US groups, the British, the Japanese, the, everybody involved in this project fought like tooth and nail. 
So the paper is published under the Arabidopsis Genome Initiative as the author. It never comes up in people's PubMed searches for authors. People relentlessly have complained about this since that day, to have the author list be a concept rather than individual authors. Um, and they almost never have done it again. <laughs> uh, and um, so even that one tiny little experiment with uh, changing the currency was, an, I, like you said, most of these things have failed when you try and socially engineer things in, in that ways. Um, but people continue to talk about, you know, I mean, like the dream model that I've heard is that, uh, you know, it's like a socialistic model of science where everybody gets a small amount of money and, you know, they can do whatever they want. Right? This is why I mean, people talk about this dream where, you know, and your, your evaluation is, um, you know, have you not screwed up, basically. And rather than having, you know, it's like the 99% one, but we should do Occupy NIH or something. Um, <laughs> rather than having some labs getting hundreds of millions of dollars and others getting nothing, this would distribute the money. And you could save an enormous, you truly could save an enormous amount of money by getting rid of review. That's the, the, the argument here. Now, in practice, people laugh. I mean, this is just, it's ludicrous. Like how you would change over to a system like this, it, I mean, like it makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, maybe one institution could do it. But how you would actually do this in practice, even if it would save money, there's no plan that anybody has had to, to do this. So I have not heard any example of an alternative currency model that is tenable in the short term future. What about, uh, I mean, one thing that stands out just by doing some, some history of authorship, you know, you see that, you know, initially credit, there was such an emphasis on the idea, the conception of the study, you know, the novelty of the idea, rather than the labor. Uh, instead, today, with the kind of the data mining stuff, you know, it's becoming more, you know, still you have, of course, the, the you know, the, the design part, but, you know, labor is becoming a lot more evident, or think about, you know, clinical trials, you know, sometimes the idea is not exactly earth shaking, but there is a lot of sweat. So, um, my impression is that labor is really not, I mean, the, the current model, that is the author model, is still, I think, it privileges the, you know, the idea, the conception, you know, over the labor. And if you look at debates in, um, in patent law today, the split is extreme. Right? On one side, you have the software industry effectively saying, it's not clear we need patents because uh, you know, the obsolescence of what we do is pretty fast. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of uh, capital invested uh, to get uh, new products going. So they don't think that actually patenting is crucial. And they actually lobby. Uh, in this direction. On the other side, you have the pharmaceutical company, as you say, no, we put uh, 10 billion bucks uh, to develop a drug, so if you touch this molecule, we're going to kill you. So, <laughs> it's, so it's obvious that there is a, a, a close correlation between uh, capital investment and time and, 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 and openness. You know, if you, if you are toward the pole where it's not that expensive, uh, or time consuming to do things, you tend to share. If you are instead on, on, the, on, the, on the pole where your work is both expensive and time consuming, people share less. So it looks like labor and or capital, because you know, in, in, in the two things go hand in hand, seems to be, you know, uh, like, you know, your example of, uh, you know, we wanted to put this stuff in, you know, in the public, but still, we didn't want to be scooped because you had to put a lot of time. So this is, wasn't just, you know, data that you collected in a day. You were really effectively protecting the capital that you had invested in that, in that work. In, in your case of the Rose Franklin, you know, with the picture, these guys, they get it on the work, they see a picture, and that's all they take. Uh, so so it, 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 there are two 
uh, you know, under the rubric data, you have two completely different, you know, animals. So, can you think of a way to make uh, labor visible when it comes to credit, except by counting? Besides the assumption that if you have worked more, you have published more, because that seems to be the assumption. You know, it, you know, it, there, there must be some correlation between sweat and number of words, which I don't think is necessarily the case. No, although there was a recent genome paper that tried to claim that, which was completely <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, the funding agencies <coughs> play a big role in this. So the Human Genome Project had an enormous amount of labor and capital involved. And yet it had some people who were pushing a notion that it was for, for the public good. And that was part of what led to the pressure for releasing the data in a, as I said, not completely open manner, but a reasonably uh, open manner. And um, in the genomics world, there were discussions probably every week about whether or not people who contributed labor should be authors on papers. Um, there are multiple conflicting guidelines from federal agencies about what determines authorship, and it's constantly being revised and is inconsistent. Um, and there's a constant debate about this, but the general consensus, even now and certainly then, was that labor alone was not sufficient to be listed as an author on a publication. Um, Many genome centers uh, deviated from that with some of the papers where they would list the people who really never saw the paper, literally, um, uh, as <laughs> Jenna, for example. Um, I worked at the Human Genome Project, and I'm an author. And, and on at least two of the papers, I just did. I just made all those. Right? <laughs> and that was debated a lot. Um, whether or not that was a good idea. And so what I actually, I, I didn't mention this before, at the Fort Lauderdale meeting, um, what I proposed, and um, I eventually, uh, uh, we eventually did more and more of, was something we had done in the Tetrahymena Project, and I hadn't really thought about it. So when we had applied for funding in the Tetrahymena Project, the, the people involved in the project really wanted to be as open as possible. And they came to their various genome centers to ask, you know, bid on how much it would cost to do this project. And then we will submit a grant with you. And I told them, I'd be happy to be involved in the project. I will work towards openness. I want extra money. I want money to support a couple of extra people in my lab in order to look at the data in exchange for sharing it with other people. And so, our compromise was not that we would that we would get the labor credit for the labor involved in that project, but instead that we would get extra cash. Um, and I routinely do this now for projects. That is, I will go to a funding agency and say, we would love to do a project, we will release everything openly, but we really need extra support, both because it's hard to write, and it's actually hard to release stuff, um, and in addition, because we are releasing stuff, we will, we will potentially be at a disadvantage for a period of time to other people who are not, because they get our stuff and their stuff. And many funding agencies will support this, hmm. NSF won't, but many will. Well, I think part of, part of the issue is, is where the currency attaches in science. And it's, it, you don't get credit for claiming something in science, you get credit for demonstrating something in science. Otherwise, you know, we could set up a random mm -hmm. statement generator and have it auto post to Twitter and uh, <laughs> prove a, something. That's a good business. Then we could be like, you know, <laughs> we deserve the Nobel Prize. That was our idea. Uh, we, we didn't prove it. We just said it. We tried to submit all possible 10 base pair DNA sequences for that. <laughs> yeah. And you don't get credit for that. Right? No. Know, the, the currency doesn't attach I can't believe to it. they didn't and this is this sort of like, if we're going to go the definition for being scooped, maybe it's that. It's, it's the fear that something that you've done proves an idea that someone else already had. That you, and so they've got the idea and they've got your proof, even though you didn't know your proof yeah. was proof for anything. And that's the great fear. 
and there's no currency for generating the information that proves the idea right now. Right? That, there are even guidelines that prohibit it. I think that's that's a very instructive point. That organization up in Washington, Microsoft executive, just they just generate intellectual property. They don't have to make anything. Intellectual ventures. Intellectual ventures. You can send them a troll for Christmas. A troll for Christmas. Little troll doll. Yeah. Send a troll to troll.com. So I mean, it does seem like this the risk does exist. That's the entire business model. Yeah. Right. And uh, I'm told that it's sort of like getting a visit from the mafia. Like they come in and go, nice whiteboards. It'd be a real, it's a real shame if something happened to them. Yeah. And so you paid a license fee. Uh, but even, even people who have provided their patents to IAB are being sued by IAB. Right. Uh, Google, for one. So uh, I don't know how long that's going to last. I think that you're going to see some patent reform come through. Because there's just there's too many <coughs> fault lines in the patent system right now. It's interesting that guy felt it though, is the inventor, coiner of the term patent troll. Yes. <laughs> uh, I have a question. We, we talked a lot about data. How about software source code? I had some really good and some really terrible experiences in that. And I contributed to some code and then they sold it without telling me. And I found out a few months ago that they sold it and they excused it. They apologized to me. So now I'm trying to actually go through our story. I, I don't trust my work, so I'll find something else. Or part of my code was, it's GPL, and I say it clearly, it was used by Lawrence Livermore, and a fellow who used it said, oh, I use your software. And it's not in this uh, DOD software. So well, it's GPL, it has to be, you know, the whole thing has to be out, or kind of different thing. So what do I do about that? What do you do about that? Is there any experience with that in software? Copyrights and stuff like that? You yeah, have strong IP there. I mean, the, the thing about copyright is it's a relatively strong form of intellectual property. And so you have strong remedies. If, if you release it under a license and they didn't comply with the terms, they're infringing. But who do I call? I mean, who do I, I go through free software foundation? Who do no, I, I think you, you, you go through your lawyers here. I mean, this is a pretty, that's a cut and dry. Right, but these case. lawyers here, the people who sold it are UC Berkeley. I don't want to, I don't like these lawyers here are going to go through against UC Berkeley. That's my, my <laughs> theories if, of if UCs. You use, if you use GPL, you should talk. I think uh, that the. Uh, <coughs> the, the, the Free Software Foundation, I've been told that they've been actually, they've been quite effective in uh, going after people who have violated the GPL license. In fact, the last time I checked, it was a couple of years ago, apparently no lawsuit involving a GPL license went to judgment. I mean, but the, the, the GPL also doesn't prevent sale, right? So if, if the, the GPL enables commercial sale, right? So if you put something under GPL, sale is not illegal. What's illegal is locking up changes to the code. So, I mean, you, you cannot but restrict But if I own copyright, can they sell my copyrighted code? If you have licensed under GPL, absolutely. GPL does not prevent the sale, right? You provided a license that grants commercial resale privileges when you use GPL, right? What they cannot do is enclose the code that you gave, but they can absolutely sell it. They don't have to give you enough. Right? The four freedoms of free software explicitly exclude um, restrictions on commercial activity. So if you have, but it has to be open, it has to be also GPL on the other side. If they distribute changes, those changes have to be open as well. That's the deal. But you know, but things if they have violated those terms, you have lots and lots of remedies. Far more powerful than in, in most of the stuff that we've been talking about. So what if you're a, a young graduate student uh, early in your career and you believe in openness a lot but um, the system certainly uh, keeps you down maybe your PI doesn't approve of it and uh, do you have any suggestions <coughs> for, for graduate students that feel like you're in that place? I don't really do it. Get another laugh? No. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah I mean it's, uh, it's a complicated landscape I think that um, it depends on which portion of open science you're heavily invested in um, and, and what you're trying to do because, uh, you know, um, the PI in the lab, of course, is usually the one who got the grants um, and is usually the one who is responsible for that activity. So it can be a complicated interaction if you have a different 
if you have a different openness practice relative to them um, with things that relate to their projects. Uh, um, I mean, I've had this interaction with collaborators all the time, even in my position, and it's, I have no simple model for, for solving that issue. I mean, I think the thing that you can try and do, and this is, for example, why I have moved into a lot of the social networking world, is um, for, for getting credit for things and for sharing information. Um, it is important for people to be aware of who did what. And um, so I'll just give you an example. You know, a, a graduate student comes up with an idea that then turns into a postdoc's project, right? Um, if that graduate student then is looking for a postdoc position um, and no one has told anybody in the world that they were involved in that project, it might be harder for them to get a postdoc position. So I started experimenting with a lot of social networking in order to broadcast what was going on in these types of collaborative environments in order to try and say, this was a 75 author paper, Tatra Hyman paper, for example, this is how it played out and, and tried to share that as broadly with the world as possible. So and how would you do that? How would you try to broadcast? I mean, it's a great idea. Well, so, so um, five years ago, I started a blog. Um, and now I experiment with, I mean, I, you know, again, people criticize playing with Twitter or something like that. It's a computer program. It's a tool. That's all it is. And there are people that use it positively, and there are people like Britney Spears who use it like idiots. I, I, I don't care about that part of it. But it can help you communicate a field. And so for I'll just give you an example. I have a postdoc who's now in Canada. He was working on a project that related to studying microbes in the environment. And he had this idea, crazy idea, um, to develop a software site for using BitTorrent to share biological data. He's been obsessed with this for a long time. So I was like, go ahead, that's great, um, really cool. We wrote a little paper that came out in BLOS 1 on BioTorrents. We created a website for this to convince people to use you know, the software that's used mostly to share porn and movies and other things for sharing biological data sets. Now, no one would have known about this, but I, posted a thing about it and I sent email to maybe a thousand people, including Tim O'Reilly um, from O'Reilly Publishers, and he then broadcast it to the world. And within two days, he was getting calls from like 20 reporters. And he got, you know, written up in multiple science, Nature wrote about it, Science wrote about it, uh, multiple other journals wrote about it. Um, and no one would have seen it in PLOS One without us distributing it to people. So the problem with data and publications now is that everyone's overwhelmed. Everybody is so busy and so information overloaded. The systems that exist for feeding us papers that we should be interested in suck. And so you have to get stuff to the right people. And that's why I started experimenting with these things. And now, I mean, now I, you know, I have, uh, I, you could call it power in a way, to distribute information about these things because I have built a social network around Twitter and a blog and other systems. And I've done that almost entirely to promote stuff within our lab and open science in general. Um, but, you know, so you have to work harder in some cases when you are not following the traditional path. This is what I'm <coughs> basically saying. And I have to work harder to trumpet papers published in my lab. We had one published in March that easily could have been in nature. We published it in PLOS 1. I believe in open access publishing. 
but I sent it to the right people and it got written up in The Economist and The New York Times and the paper has gotten 45,000 hits on the journal. I mean, so, uh, but I had to work. I spent three days writing email messages <laughs> to everybody I knew who might be interested. I wrote a five-page blog post describing the entire history of the paper. Which was and, longer than the paper. Which was longer than the paper. <laughs> <laughs> and I sent that post to, you know, hundreds of people. And so I've taken it upon myself. I believe the current system is broken. I want to do things in a different model. And it takes work. So I, th I think it's doable. It's hard. But you, you, you have to work with your advisor. You have to figure out ways to do it in a, in a context. And you have to trumpet some of the things you're doing so that you get credit. For <coughs> so in, in the narrative that you wrote about the history of the paper, that's also where you mentioned the, the grad students who has worked with... I so mean, it, so I've done this for now every paper, so okay. I mean, I do this all the time. Okay. For that paper, I wanted to give credit to... I mean, this paper took seven years to write, mind you. Um, uh, I, I wanted to explain the entire history, why we didn't publish it seven years ago when we started it, because I moved to Davis from this other place, and we got busy, and, you know, I wanted to put all of that out there. Now, mind you, I think that all should be in the paper these days. Uh, but that's not how people publish papers. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge all the people that I could think of. So I wrote this down while we were all talking, um, who contributed ideas. I think that the biggest broken part of publishing right now is the acknowledgment section in papers. Mm -hmm. I think an acknowledgment section given online publishing should be 45 pages long. I think you should be able to put everything anybody contributed, and yet journals will not let you do this. They actually will tell you that's too long, an acknowledgement section, even for an online publication. So that's partly why I do it, is to acknowledge the history of the ideas, because I want to get, I want to be in a new system where people get credit for what I overheard during coffee, and then you know, stole their idea. Tag, uh, if, if I could tag ID, the person with an ID, you could yeah. find them 20 years later that they contributed to this paper. It would be great for historians of science. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a little story regarding a graduate student benefiting from the Eisen megaphone. Um, uh, it's an unusual megaphone. <laughs> I, uh, a couple of months ago, I had an idea for uh, making a big improvement to uh, our recording technique that we use, and uh, it's kind of a weird idea, um, using a 3D printer to do something that's normally done with a thundering herd of graduate, uh, undergraduates or a robot or something like that, and uh, um, I really wanted to talk about it with other people, but I was afraid that if I, if I was just talking about it with people that somebody else would go and do this because it's not actually that hard. Um, and lose the opportunity to have the credit for it. Uh, but it wasn't, it's not the sort of thing that like by itself would be a paper. Um, it would be like a piece of a paper or something like that. Um, but I needed some help with it, so I needed to talk with other people. Um, and so, you know, after having it going for a while, I wrote a blog post and then sent, the, sent it to Jonathan and then he sent it to other people and um, uh, the incoming hits on my blog almost took down our server. <laughs> um, and I got a lot of really, really useful feedback for it. And also, like, it kind of, like, established, like, I think in the community's right mind that, um, you know, there's no paper yet, but um, this is my idea, right? And I can always point back to the date stamp on that blog post and say, see, see, that's my idea. Right? And, you know, this is sort of outside of the peer review system. You know, it's only social media at this point. Um, but uh, I feel a lot more comfortable now talking about this with other people because, like, now it's in the public in a quasi-official way. But I, I think this goes back to your point, though. If you had done that without being in the Eisen lab, you would have taken and, and your, your blog, on which most nearly takes down the server, right? You'd probably get punished. my server. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and I think that's the thing. The systems for dealing with the outcome of this ha have to be in place for it to work. Yeah. And or 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 have to be a place for it to work well, perhaps. Um, 
so that if, if you're going to strategically share, which is sort of what we're advocating, is that, that maybe there's a strategic benefit to doing this, um, you've got to have some systems in place for getting the word out there and for dealing with what comes back. Because you can very easily be swamped with replies that take you off the track that your PI wants you to be on. Um, and you can get punished for that as well. So you know, the, the, if you're going to move to a world in which you're trying to deal with having, being open as a way to help your filtering mechanisms work better, you need, I think you sort of need to make a commitment to it. Um, there's an old saw in the Creative Commons world, which is that being half open is like half learning to break a board with your head. Um, <laughs> you don't break the board and you get a really bad headache. And, and that's what you get for going half open. So, you know, shareware instead of open source software or, you know, bespoke half open copyright licenses. You know, there, it's, it's, it's almost better to exist inside your old system than it is to sort of go a half baked open way. And so it was a flippant response from none of you know, change labs, but that may actually be the right answer. <laughs> um, rather than trying to sort of you know, either go around your PI or go with sort of a mealy half open approach. I'm, I'm not sure that's going to scale because <coughs> if it works, you're going to be overwhelmed by it and you're not going to have any of the benefits of an actual open system to help you deal with it. Does uh, anything about hypothesis? Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it, yeah. I mean, maybe you can, I, I'm drawing a blank on So I, all I know about it is a Kickstarter project that's uh, ideas to peer review the internet and they haven't done anything yet, but uh, be able to, I guess, build the infrastructure on the web that makes it easy to, to look at anything on the internet and make a comment on it. And I don't know where that would Well, I mean, I. So excited. Yeah, I mean, like, but but this has a. I remember now it has a, you know, an actual reputation system. Yeah, sort of like around. Stack Overflow or something. So there's a there's many of these that are out there. There's a new one that I've just been playing with called Connect.me, which is also a reputation system. It's actually really really nice. I, I have I registered with Hypothesis this or whatever it yeah, is, yeah. Um, but I haven't played with it that much. Um, they're all sort of around this notion of. Um, The, the, if you want to have a tracking system and a more open system, you need to be able to know, like I was saying, who put out an idea. But you also need to know who evaluated an idea. And this gets back to the openness and peer review and things. And um, <coughs> uh, I'll give you an example of this. I personally believe that, in part because it's closed, the peer review system is pretty broken right now. Um, the closed system is ostensibly there to protect people from retribution, and really what it does is it allows people to steal. And I think the negative far outweighs the positive. And I would like to move to a world where there's much more open peer review, and I also think that two peer reviewers is insufficient to establish the importance of a piece of work, and therefore I think we should move towards more post publication, post-release peer review, so that you can then broaden the community. And that's what Hypothesis and Connect.me and other places are about, which is if someone on Amazon, you know, rates something, but you have no ability to sort of know what their, the rating of the rater is, in essence, it's hard to know what they're doing. And Amazon has built a, you know, they actually do rate the raters, of course, as does eBay, as does a lot of places. And these are sort of analogous things for either science or the web in, in general, is um, a layer behind whatever it is, let's just say a publication, that is post-publication evaluation. And um, PLOS One is built in part on this model. So PLOS One is this journal published by the Public Library of Science, which is, I mean, they don't implement this perfectly, but in, what they're really supposed to do is ask reviewers to determine if something is technically sound. And that's it. Not if it's interesting, not if it's important. Just is it, are the claims, you know, we found X supported by what was presented. And that's it. 
And it's based on the notion that importance will be determined later, not by some reviewers. It's why I love PLOS One as a journal. Um, and so a lot of these things are, are, that is the attempt people are trying to get to. So PLOS tried to do something which I think was a bad idea in the first place, which was to have people comment on papers on the PLOS site so that you could, and rate them on the PLOS site. I think it was a bad idea because people spend their time on Facebook and Twitter and social media. And what should have been done was to build a system to scrape information from existing social networks to layer upon those publications as opposed to forcing people to go to the journal sites, which they don't do. And this is an interesting thing. So research blogging out of Seed Media, which has done a lot, a lot of very closed things. I actually, I, I, I help Seed with research blogging, so I will disclose that. But the, the idea behind research blogging is you sort of sign up, you get a, you get a, you get a, a, an account with RV that lets you put a chunk of HTML code on any blog post you post where you're posting about a peer-reviewed article. And then it harvests all of those and aggregates them, so you only need to look at one site, you can see all of the posts about peer-reviewed literature. And there's a lot of criticism that I would make about RV. The, the way it works, and the heuristics are terrible, it's very sort of weak, uh, but it, it at least provides a way to scrape from the, the social web what people are saying without having to, and you can say it on your own blog, you don't have to go say it on the site for the article, which is the natural place, that's where your audience is, it's on your blog. Your audience isn't on the article that no one's reading, <coughs> right, but you're talking about it might get people read. And I think that's, I think that's what's likely to scale, is, is systems that don't force you to go to someone else's website to bitch about an article. So, so because the, the system for the most of the existing journals does not incorporate this, um, I've now just taken it upon myself, even for things I am not involved in, to go to the journal sites and post links to blogs and other things where people are discussing those papers. So I did this for this paper that, again, we published in March that could have you know, been in Nature and got, you know, covered in The Economist, etc. I went to the PLOS One, this was published in PLOS One, the PLOS One site for this paper, and I just, there's supposed to be a commenting function, instead of posting comments, I just said, oh, this was covered in the New York Times, this was covered in The Economist, this, and I just kept posting the links. And someone from PLOS, you know, my brother, some, uh, full disclosure, my brother was one of the co-founders of the Public Library of Science. Um, and I'm, I know a lot of the people involved, but someone from PLOS wrote to me and said, can you do that? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean, can I do that? It's a commenting function, I posted a link. <laughs> it didn't say I couldn't, but they, they were thinking in this like model where there was a rule as to what you could post. And here I was getting 50,000 hits coming to the paper. And their concern was whether or not I could post links. Uh, I think we get, we get trapped by architecture. Yeah, right. we, get trapped by, we get trapped by architecture really easily, and that's why I get worried about the the the, the more complex a credit or a reputation system is, the yeah. more the less I think it's going to work, uh, because you get trapped in architecture and you you design your way out of the out of the solution, right? So you know, the 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 uses of you know PLOS wasn't founded to start PLOS one, but I think PLOS is going to wind up being remembered for PLOS one. In the end. <laughs> so I'll tell you. Um, yeah, it's the world's largest publisher. So, so there's a secret I can, I'm going to tell you guys now. Not uh, companies. It's the world's largest title. So, so uh, people may not know the, the whole history. In um, Harold Barmas was the head of the NIH. He called for uh, evaluation of how much money the NIH spent on publishing in broadly, and the Congressional Budget Office came back and told him billions of dollars a year. Thank you. And this is what basically led to the starting of the Public Library of Science, which was started by Harold Varmus, my brother, and Pat Brown at Stanford. And it started as a petition to get people to publish in open access journals and to review for open access journals. 100,000 people signed it, sort of like the letter to get Katehi to resign, and, and no one did anything. Everybody signed it. They had no commitment to it whatsoever, and it had no effect. So then they decided to start journals. And they had a plan which the, my own brother did not include me in because I am, became the academic editor-in-chief of their snooty journal, PLOS Biology. So they started two 
high, you know, high quality is what they call the journals, PLOS Biology and PLOS Medicine, to ostensibly try and show people that you could publish in an open access manner, but very high quality work. And then they started sort of mid-tier journals a few years later, plus computational biology, plus genetics, et cetera, to show that you could have society-run journals public, you know, all doing open access. And then they started PLOS One. Well, it turns out, even though they didn't tell them, the entire plan was to create PLOS One. So they went to the Moore Foundation to ask for money to do this. The Moore Foundation very wisely said, do you have a marketing plan? And Pat Brown and my brother were like, that's a marketing plan. I don't. So they, they, got, they got introduced to a marketing person. They didn't like the Moore Foundation one, so they found another one. And the marketing person sat down with them. Their goal was to create PLOS One. Actually, Pat Brown wanted to create something even more radical, which was not peer-reviewed at all. But they decided that peer review on technical merit was you know, good, and they wanted to publish everything, basically. And the marketer said, no one's going to publish there. You don't have a name. Nobody recognizes POS. Who's going to publish in a journal that publishes everything? What you have to do is create an imprint, an uh, imprint of quality, a name. So they created. The journal I'm involved in as a scam to get people to then eventually publish in PLOS One. I had never heard that story. That's great. I had never heard the story until that class forum meeting in San Francisco. They never told me. My own brother. Nature Nature has responded to PLOS One by creating a competitor called Scientific Reports, but it's half open, right? You have to pay them and they get the commercial rights. Right? And it's not taking off like hotcakes because it was it was designed by an organization who doesn't understand abundance. It was designed by an organization that creates scarcity, not strategically, but that's that's their business. And so you know, I'm not sure PLOS One could have emerged from any place else because it didn't have the the the, the architecture socially or you know, organizationally that, that that understood it. Um, but I think it's I mean it's 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 the best example of of what you can do with the digital world. No, just, you know, you're no longer constrained by how much it costs to print and mail it. Right? That's, that's, that's actually a really fundamental change that, that the internet brings to publishing, which is it's costless. So you can publish everything. And if you're only going to review it on merit, you don't have to sit around and argue about whether or not it's meaningful. Right, and it's so much better to review for journals like this. Like, I don't have to go look at, you know, is this going to be important? When I review for PLOS 1, I can just say, Okay, just put on the blinders. Did they do what they claimed they did? And can they make, statistically, can they make this claim? I don't have to go say, oh, well, there were 17 other papers in this area, and, you know, here they are. They're all by me, of course, but, you know, I've got, so that's usually what review says. You, you forgot to cite these 17 papers. Um, and, yeah, that's right. Um, and um, as it, is, it is the single largest publisher of biomedical literature. And I think a lot of people like this model because review tends to be quicker because people, it's easier to review. And again, I have this, you know, potentially very interesting paper. I knew I could trumpet it. I didn't need the imprint of a journal name. It didn't matter to me where it was published. It mattered to me that it was open. And then the bloggers could take the figure. So we didn't talk about this. PLOS uses a broad Creative Commons license to publish all of the papers. And that license basically says that you can do anything you want with the material as long as you acknowledge the source. Um, so you could sell it on the street corner if you wanted to. And you, know, you wouldn't get any sales, but, you know, uh, but you can do anything you want with it. And this frees up people, which includes reporters and um, teachers and bloggers and such, to do whatever they want with the material. And if you have something interesting, it's much easier for them to do something with that than to deal with, you know, yeah. You know, one thing that is really cute, I mean, from a historical point of view, that what PLS1 is doing, that is just asking reviewers, is this basically technically sound? Is, is actually very close to old-fashioned, good old-fashioned book censorship. Yeah. Because in a sense, you know, you know say, 1700, what a book censor would do is that, is this book saying nasty things about Jesus Christ? 
No. Okay. Published. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't. It wasn't. What else was in there? You know, is this valuable poetry? Forget it. You know, just you know, just check certain boxes. And then, so peer review, you know, scientific peer review moved from this. You know, the first peer review was like, you know, is this person claiming another perpetual motion machine? No. Okay. In the case, we publish it. So is it really actually yeah. going back to this minimalist? Uh, you know, peer review standards that were basically based, at, you know, on uh, not assessment of quality, but just assessment of, you know, is, does this make any sense? Uh, how is the administration, you see the administration looking at those publications? Are you allowed to count them? Because you eventually have to come out, you know, every three years to do some type of review. Uh, well, I mean, you want the real answer, or I, mean, I don't care. Uh, so, um, you know, if I get written up in The Economist, that's going to count. But just do you have in your college, do you have being conscious who say, well, okay. You know, in my department, my home department, Evolutionary Ecology, is remarkably good about not doing it in that approach. Now, there still are faculty meetings where people talk about the quality of the journal where you publish, as opposed to the quality <coughs> of the work that you publish. So I, we still need to change the entire system, including at this institution, and even in the Evolutionary Ecology Department, which is better than many other departments about doing this. Now, Harold Varmus, who was head of Memorial Sloan Kettering for many years, he's now the head of the National Cancer Institute, but he was head of Memorial Sloan Kettering for many years. He, I've talked to him about this exact issue. They instituted a policy at Sloan Kettering for um, merit review that basically said, you will evaluate people based upon their actual contributions. So metrics that involve surrogates, like what the name of the journal was, were basically frowned upon. Which meant that review panels had to read yeah. people's papers. <laughs> um, it and that, so, so it required more work. And he accepted that it required more work. They added administrative support to many of these sort of review panels because they knew that people would have to actually get the papers because they were supposed to actually, rather than looking at impact factor of journals. So, it's, it's much harder to do this, but in the end, it pays off in the long run. So you have a transition state where people are used to evaluating people by whether or not they have an R01 grant in, in biology, and you know, do they have nature, science, cell, or now boss biology, even though it's you know, a, a scam. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a high impact scam. It is a high impact scam. Um, uh, so so they, we, they do that. But, um, it needs to transition to a place where you evaluate people by their actual contributions. And that is why PLOS, for example, has now been releasing article metrics as opposed to journal metrics. Um, so if you can measure number of downloads, citations, etc., in an open manner, not you know, through a closed uh, database, you can actually at least measure the impact of the article as opposed to the impact of the journal. And that is a big fight. It's, it's not pervasive in people talking about this. But the way to do it is to just say we should evaluate people by their, the quality of their work. But and do you see that happening at QC here, at QC Davis, or is it kind of? I, I think every institution in the country has bean counters that would like to be lazy and use surrogates to measure people's quality instead of measuring their quality. And that includes UC Davis. It varies by department and by school. I, it's, a big, it's a big fight. But the evidence from scooping you know, is that basically all the articles or, 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 or uh, gramification that has been found to be measured have always been found by the author, which suggests that not a lot of people read. Yep. You know, I mean, you know, that's to me tangible evidence that people in the field could not tell that they had been pleasurized by their best, you know. So, so, the, the, uh, so I think that it's count, I, I'm completely on your side, but the, the empirical evidence suggests that, you know, reading is becoming a... Right, so we need, we need to measure people's impact. So there's, you know, John Hoganish? So there's this guy at UPenn who has been trying to introduce the fantasy baseball equivalent for scientists. <laughs> so to measure... <laughs> 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 So there are multiple people that have tried to do this, but this would be great to have you know, real statistical measures of 
predictability of what your future contribution will be by, you know, downloads of articles or, you know, number of, the inverse of the number of words in your abstract or something, right? If you find something big, the abstract should be short. Um, all those types of things he's trying to measure and then see whether or not they correlate with future success. Um, I think uh, this was a, a lot of fun. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank uh, this part of the table for coming. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll do more things about tricky aspects of science uh, in the future together with uh, the Open, uh, open Science uh, group at Davis. Thank you again. Thank you.